All right, here's another one that's an, a review and an examination of a popular amp on the market, not a repair as far as I know. I've been doing research for the upcoming Amps Under $2,000 video. So far, I've done the Sir Ombre for research and the Freeman Runt 20. This is the Marshall SV20, the Studio Vintage 20, the little 20-watt plexi. And uh, let's see what sets it apart from its com competitors. The uh, Sir Ombre is about 1600. It's uh, a different set of sounds and a different goal, but there is some tonal overlap. The Freeman Runt 20 is more of a higher gain JCM 800 variant. It's about 1500. And this one, uh, which is more of a plexi as they market it at least, is about 1900 from a local brick and mortar independent music store. As we go through, we'll compare the Marshall to the Friedman to the Sir to give a sense of comparable quality. Uh, this Marshall is the most expensive of the three. Let's see if it lives up to that. All right, it's the traditional four hole, normal high treble uh, volume pots or loudness controls as they're labeled here. Treble middle bass presence, low and high power, standby in the middle, uh, mains on off, and that square indicator that sometimes likes to rotate. Very traditional for a plexi. It has the actual plexiglass panel. It's not a metal panel like uh, most of the less expensive Marshalls these days are. For those who don't know what a plexi means, it's literally that this is a clear acrylic panel plexiglass or perspex as it's called in uh, the UK. And on the other side, there's gold uh, metallic paint. And through that paint, they have black lettering. So the lettering and the gold comes through from the, re from the rear. The top is just clear plastic acrylic and it gives that nice depth effect. They can break if you're not careful, but overall they hold up pretty well and they're really pretty. All right, the rear is pretty typical for current Marshall. It's got this stupid metal grill. I'm sure it's so people can't reach in here and burn their, their little fingers on the tubes. Makes it really hard to change tubes on a gig. If you own one, I would suggest leaving this out. It does nothing except make things difficult. Um, doesn't have the prettier brass, but uh, these screws will hold up better. A note on these screws that we'll get to in a minute. Uh, so these five black screws hold the chassis to this rear panel. And these six silver screws, which are probably wood screws, we'll find out, hold this panel to the cabinet. So I'm gonna take all this apart and I'm gonna start by removing this black panel here. I've already disconnected, or I am disconnecting the speaker first as well. We'll get to the next bit after I get that out of the way. In many of my recent amp videos on Seriotone, uh, Sir, not, not the Sir, the Sir had a different type of screw, but the Seriotone and the uh, Friedman, which had these kind of uh, dress washers, they had another washer beneath the dress washer that keeps the edges of the dress washer from cutting through the Tolex. This amp does not have those. If you really, really tighten these, and over the years, as this is removed and put back in place and retightened, this will cut into that Tolex. It's a shame they didn't use just a number six or number eight screw uh, washer beneath uh, the dress washer just to protect that. And the little dress washer goes in the app. I'll fish it out in just a moment. All right, the inside of the cabinet and the build construction looks very high quality. It's not especially beautiful, but it's high quality. The back of this panel is still a bit sticky from the application of the Tolex. Um, this metal panel here that I removed, it's sticking to the speaker now. The speaker connection actually feeds through it. You would, to remove this fully, you would actually have to remove this screw and disconnect these two quick connects that hold the speaker wire together to pull that through if you wanted to take this out of the amp fully, which is not a huge deal. Somewhat disappointingly to me, though that is subjective, that is a VT Junior, so the G10 50 watt uh, V-type speaker, the 10 inch version. The Sir Ombre uh, has the full 12, the V-type 12. I don't see any reason given the dimensions and where the tubes are in this amp that this could not have had the 12 inch speaker. Maybe that's an option. In general, especially when it comes to a one by 10 versus a one by 12, the 12 inch speaker will sound a lot bigger. The Friedman at a lower price point has the incredibly great sounding Creamback 65, 
12-inch speaker. So that's a nod to the Friedman, unless this is just an incredible pairing that just sounds phenomenal. We'll get there. Um, before I go much further, though, I do want to ensure that these screws are tight. They look very tight. It's like the uh, frame has been compressed here. I'm sure that they are very tight as a result. I'll check the other two, but yeah, let me get you a different angle on that. I don't know how well that shows up to the camera, but to the eye, it's very apparent that the frame is actually uh, concave here around the screw. This screw was over tightened from the factory. They need to adjust their torque settings when they install such things. It probably won't affect the sound. Hopefully it will not. If it does, I'll let my friend the dealer know and he can get a, an exchange under warranty from Marshall. But uh, it's not too comforting. Anyway, let's get to the amp itself. All right, now to the five screws that hold the chassis to that back panel. The, these are number three PosiDrive screws. You can use a Phillips if you're careful in doing it by hand. If you're using a power tool, you only want to use a PosiDrive. But what's really important is that you not use a number two in there because a number two will not fit snugly and you will strip things. You must use a number three. Phillips will work. Positive drives even better. I'm just going to give them all a careful turn at first. Just make sure that nothing is stripped or has too much resistance. And then just spin away. You can use a power tool if you have a positive drive tip. I need to buy some. I've been meaning to for a long time. But for five screws, I can do this pretty quickly by hand. All right, before I go into the insides, I've removed the two uh, Marshall labeled JJ EL84, uh, sorry, EL34s so I can set this upside down. I'll check what the other stock tubes are. I'm sure they're JJs, etc. as well. Uh, the transformers are pretty much the same type, though the end bell here is shinier than you'd find on like the Classic 20, not Classic 20, Origin 20. Belt and tube sockets, so that's good. So 1 by 16, 1 by 8, or 2 by 16, so this is the 8 ohm, 1 by 4, or 2 by 8, so 16 ohm tap, uh, a jack, 8 ohm jacks, 4 ohm jacks, a DI out, I wouldn't expect too much of that, not that useful a thing, um, FX loop on off, we'll start with it off, send return, no level controls, it's a pretty basic effects loop, we'll take a look at that later. Fuse, uh, mains fuse in the drawer here. Uh, pretty typical stuff. Um, let's take a look inside now. All right, I'm going to talk about a lot of this stuff in kind of a, a large theory sense rather than just bore you with a lot of individual observations. Right off the bat, this thing is not built nearly as well as the Sir or the Friedman. Surprise, surprise. It is better built in some aspects than a lot of recent PCB Marshalls. But in other ways, it's just the same. Uh, the input jacks, the output jacks are really crappy. They're not cliff jacks. They don't hold up well. I'm going to pull the rear speaker jacks to make sure they have not continued on the, the uh, normaling mistakes from the JCM uh, 900 and 2000 series. I don't think they probably would have, but one never knows. That's a big thing to look out for these on Marshalls. I'm really disappointed with these little pots that they use. This is essentially the same kind of pot you'd find in a Blues Junior, and I associate this with very inexpensive amplifiers, not $1,900 amplifiers. I think the one of the hooks to this is that this is supposedly a UK amp versus the import amps from, uh, you know, like the Origin series. But a lot of this touch just says made in Asia might have been final assembled in the UK. In positives, the majority of the resistors are metal films of suitable uh, quarter watt or half watt. Not great, but okay. The plates tend to be these one watt carbon films, which are good. Um, the droppers are these two watt Vichy uh, metal films. I use these same resistors in my apps. Uh, they have them mounted way off the board, so that will not burn the board if there's a problem with it. Right here, this one, this plate was was uh, bent over and touching this dropping resistor. I'm just going to give them some separation. Uh, that happens a lot on these marshals that have all the spider-mounted 
uh, resistors. Um, when the amp is on, I will carefully jiggle all these five watts, which are mounted way off the board, which is good and bad. If something goes wrong, it's less likely to be a uh, heat issue um, on the board. But at the same time, because they have uh, lead-free solder uh, supporting quite a bit of mass, sometimes you'll get a break in that solder joint, which can ca cause arcing, and then you can cause heat image, uh, damage. So I'm really... I have seen much worse from Marshall and other companies, but at this price point, I was expecting better. All the uh, caps here, all the electrolytics are Samoas, which are generic as can be. Um, I don't have great faith in their long-term reliability, but at least they weren't mounted all at weird angles uh, like uh, many of the uh, DSL 100 replacement boards that Marshall ships out. So the sound may be fantastic, and we'll find out um, it's got an effects loop. Hopefully that explains the two TL072s in there. It's a lot more components than you would need just to do a 20-watt a uh, plexi. And I am looking at the output section. I don't know if this is cathode or fixed bias. I'll find out in just a moment. I've not looked at the literature on this. I kind of like to go into these things with no real expectations other than they are obviously calling it Studio Vintage and coming up with the plexi appointments. So um, I, I see more of what's in front of me than what I'm expecting to see, if that makes sense. Anyway, let me pull these jacks, take a look and see if there's any gotchas waiting to get an owner there. Well, it's all powered up and I've measured the bias. This is a cathode biased amp. Oh, real fast, uh, I did pull the output jacks board and there was nothing squirrely there, nothing that really gave, instilled great confidence, uh, very tiny little connections from the um, not great quality jacks to the PCB, tiny little pads and solder points, but uh, no big glaring mistakes. Um, this is cathode biased. It has a pair of EL34s and it has a plate voltage in high power mode of 253.3 volts. That's plate to cathode. These tubes are idling about 13.5 watts. This is a 30, I'm sorry, 25 watt tube. So it's biased right about 50% idle, which is extraordinarily cold for a cathode bias stamp. It's not anywhere where someone would tend to aim such things. You would typically with a pair of 34s want this to be biased closer to, oh, say 90% for reasons I don't have time to get into. And people who love Marshall, no matter what's in front of them will dismiss that anyway. But um, these 34s are almost marketing tubes. You could have a pair of 6v6s in here, have less expensive tubes, have a similar sound, and achieve the same output as they're doing with this pair of starved EL34s. The app is overall fairly quiet. This is router noise coming through. Hiss on the bright channel, not too bad. Let's see. No noise on the tone pots, the expected noise on the presence. Because they're doing the legit 5K, which has DC across it. So if you get one of these and you have noise on your presence control, that's normal, nothing to worry about. In comparison to the Origin 20, which had burnt dropping resistors, uh, I don't see any sign of that here. It's a very different type of resistor using this amp than in the Origin 20. Hopefully everything is fine as far as the actual power across the resistors. I'm going to give all these 5 watt ceramics a little bit of a jiggle like I said. Just kind of listen if there's any change. doesn't seem to be a problem. None of those solder joints visibly are bad, neither are any of those solder joints visibly great. If this were my amp, the first thing I would do is be to reflow those. But this is a brand new amp, and if I were to do that now, it, it would void the warranty, ironically. Improving it at this point would void the warranty. So I'm leaving it as is. By the way, to people's eyes on the video, this LED may be flashing or strobing. It doesn't do that to our eyes, just to the camera. 
So uh, the neighbors are having some lawn service done. You might have heard the leaf blowers in the background. I'm going to wait for them to stop, and I'm going to put this all back together, and then we'll do an actual uh, get to hear what it really sounds like, not through the lav mic. And uh, I'm sure it sounds okay. I'm just not knocked out by what's inside for the $1,900 that they're charging for it, particularly with that little 10-inch speaker. But it could just be amazeballs. We'll see.
All right. Having played it now quite a bit, um, there are two things, uh, and I'm not sure which of them is the prime contributor. I think they're both contributing. Let me first start by saying that this is a good sounding app. It does not sound like a actual 1987 or 1959. It sounds good. You can get good sounds. There are some characteristics about it that I don't care for that I would certainly say, aside from the iffy quality of some of the build, keeps it from sounding great. There's a, a fizziness at times you might have heard. I'm, I'll, hopefully I'll have pointed some of those things out with some graphics. And I don't know how much of that is the cathode bias. I don't know how much of that is the very cold cathode bias where this is going to be guaranteed to be going into crossover distortion. I'm sure I heard a good bit of that. And I don't know how much of this is the speaker. This 10-inch speaker is a good sounding 10-inch speaker, but it is not a, a 12. And uh, while it has good low end, it does not have the full low end. And uh, it's a brand new speaker. And it tends to be very, very bright. And the amp tends to be very, very bright. And there's both a fizz and a squash that comes out at times. Um, I know it's not the guitars. I know it's, you know, I'm just going straight in. I've got it jumpered. If you've not played a whole lot of old Marshalls, this probably does sound great to you. And it does sound very good. And it might be a good thing for your needs, given the build quality and the $1,900 price point. I would not buy one myself. And I, I don't think I could recommend it. Maybe if you find them used, if these things go used for maybe a thousand or so, that might be a little more feasible. They look fantastic. They sound good, but not they're not really doing the thing. And that fizziness and that compression, some of it's gonna be the speaker, some of it's gonna be the cold, cold bias. I could fix that, but that would void the warranty. So I don't think that's gonna happen, at least on this amp right now. A lot of Marshalls get very, very bright. This one gets bright. That five nanofarad cap, as you can see, is very apparent. I had the, the the normal channel quite up and just bringing in a little bit of that high treble made it quite bright. And the mids control on this, for whatever reason, isn't quite behaving the way I would hope it would, though it, it's nice. I guess the presence is doing a lot more with the uh, the clean than it did with the overdrive. So uh, this is a, is a good amp. I don't think it's good enough to justify the, the new price, especially considering that both Sir and Friedman have better built, better sounding, in my opinion, amps at a lower price. But if this thing floats your boat and you play it and you see this video, at least you know how it's built and the reservations that a tech might have about it long term. I hope you found this interesting. I admit to being a little disappointed in the amp. I had heard it in the store before, uh, but, you know, in, in, in a lot of music stores, on a non-master volume app, you're kind of limited to... And that sounds very promising at that volume. But a lot of the uh, slight weaknesses and negative characteristics of the sound only begin to exhibit at higher volumes. Um, does not have a master volume. It does have an effects loop, though. You could put a, a JHS black box or other similar uh, volume pot in a box in that effects loop and give yourself a master volume. Or you can just you know, run into a low impedance volume pedal if you wanted. 
Um, the low power mode does knock off quite a few dB, but it's not the same thing. I would expect that once you got the balance right with the, between the normal and the high treble, and if I reverse the uh, jump ring there, it'll be even better. This would be a good pedal platform for practice. If I go into the normal, then jump her over to the uh, bright, I'm going to get a little more oomph out of the normal channel and a little less bright bright. Which gives a little finer control over blending them for cleans. Anyway, I'm gonna wrap this up. This is a overall a good amp. It's not as good as I'd hoped. I don't think it quite justifies the price. Hope you enjoyed this and thanks as always for joining me.